time that I don't know what to do, I will cast my cares on you. I will cast my cares upon you. It's a great chorus. Um, it says what this passage is about, about casting our cares upon the Lord and, and to see what that means. And it's a simple song to sing. It's a nice chorus. But the truth is, living these things out is a little bit more difficult. Casting all our cares upon Him. There's some cares in this life that, that we have a hard time letting go of, that, that we'll give Him those things. But this one... I'm not so sure I can let go of it. But as we'll see today, the call is to cast all the cares upon him. So why is it hard? Why is it a challenge sometimes? Well, I think in part, to do this requires humility on our part. To humble ourselves before him. To confess our need for him. As a children, or youth, I'm sorry, as a youth shared today, they learned that lesson in part, didn't they? Of learning to trust in Him more. If you talk to them, you'll find there were always these relational things. Maybe you've been around some people for a bus ride and sharing hotel rooms for a week and, and tensions get high and what are we going to do? Well, we need to humble ourselves, not before one another, but ultimately before the Lord as well. Peter understood the problems here, I think. Peter knew what humility was about, not because he was so good at it early on, right? The Gospels tell us stories about Peter that are not glossy, nice stories. I mean, Peter was a bit of a difficult guy. You know, he refused to allow Jesus to wash his feet. He confronted Jesus when he said he was going to go to the cross, and he told him, don't talk like that. And on the night of his uh, arrest, he denies him three times. Now, if we fast forward to the book of Acts and where we find ourselves in 1 Peter, we see that Peter is a changed man. He's a humbled man. He's not perfect. But we begin to see, as we found here in the book of 1 Peter, Peter is latched on to this image of being a shepherd, just like Jesus had told him in the Gospels, to feed his sheep. We saw that first in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25, where it said, Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your soul. Maybe you thought a lot about this image of a shepherd. If you ask Darcy and I, it's not always an easy role. We've had a rough week. Uh, three of our sheep died this week. It's tough, but it requires something of us. This quote tells us about, um, about what a shepherd is. It says, The shepherd metaphor is very helpful in instructing pastors in practical biblical humility. Real shepherds are seldom famous people. The task of shepherding is humble work, hard work, dirty work, constant work, dangerous work, and definitely not high-minded work. Perhaps that why, that's why God chose to describe those who pastor his people as shepherds. The very definition of a shepherd demands humility. A proud shepherd is a contradiction of terms, a violation of God's plan, and a disgrace to the ministry. Wow. Pretty powerful thought. The Lord has shown Peter what it means to be a humble shepherd. And in this final section of the letter, we begin to see some of the things that Peter desires for his people, the people of Asia Minor, to understand. The three things that we're going to look at in each section here is to humbly cast your cares upon him in the first couple of verses, soberly resist the devil in verses 8 and 9, and confidently stand in God's grace in the closing verses there. So first, humbly cast your cares upon the Lord. That's what we saw in that chorus there. Verses 5 through 7 put it this way. In the same way, you younger men, be subject to the elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. 
Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at a proper time, casting all your cares on him, because he cares for you. In order for us to cast our cares upon the Lord, we must first be willing to humble ourselves before the Lord. This section begins with a connective thought in the same way. So when we see that, we know we have to go back up a few verses to figure out what he's talking about. And as we saw last week, as Matthew shared with us, the instructions there were to the elders, the overseers, the shepherds of the church. And so he says in the same way, the shepherd is to to humbly submit to the chief shepherd, the elders, so too the flock is to submit themselves to their shepherds, the overseers of the church. And what's interesting, Peter begins by addressing the young men. Now, believe it or not, the young men don't have a corner on the market of the lack of humility. Maybe someone you know suffers from the lack of humility, but stereotypically the young men embody that idea, don't they? And so Peter uses them. They must be willing, Peter says, to respectfully place themselves under the leadership in the church, under their shepherds. But as I said, it's not true only of the younger, it's also true of the older. And those who are older may look at the younger and their youthful zest for life and wonder, how did we get here? i got a quote for you. Listen to this quote. It says, When I was a boy, we were taught to be discreet and respectful of elders, but to present youth, uh, I'm sorry, but the present youth are exceedingly impatient of restraint. They have excursable manners, flout authority, and have no respect for the elders. Now, I don't think you'll know who said this, but but my question for you is, is, when was this written? Last week? Ten years ago? Twenty? Hundred? What do you think? Just toss out a number. You feel free to speak. I won't hold you to it. Eli, what's your guess? The ancient world. I think Eli had talked about this. It. from, go ahead and hit the uh, next one. It's from a p- Greek poet who I don't know, Hesodia, 8th century B.C. You see, this youthful pride is not a new problem. Now, in your generation, if you are not one of those young men, you can look down and say, what's with these guys? It wasn't a new problem in Peter's generation either. There's nothing new about this. And as the youth, again, spoke about their experience, and as you have a chance to ask them about it, it's good for us to hear of what they're learning what the Lord is showing them. It's good for us to hear that, for us to be challenged, for us to be changed. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5, saying this, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you, who are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. You see, that's the order that God has given us. We know in verses like in Romans 13 that we are under the authority that God has placed in a nation. But in the church, even more importantly, we're to operate in such a way as well. Spiritual growth flourishes when we have this attitude of submission and humility. Notice how Peter tells the church to clothe themselves in humility. It's an important image. It literally means to tie something on oneself. To tie something on oneself. It's like, I should have brought it, but it's like an apron that a worker would tie around themselves. In the ancient world, in the days of Peter's, in Peter's day, it would have been seen by a white scarf or an apron that would separate the freeman from the slave. And so too, Peter is getting at, so too is a Christian to tie humility on their conduct so that everyone will recognize them. The word humility describes one who willingly submits to another. 
who willingly serves, even in the lowest of tasks. Now, of course, this is best illustrated when Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Well, except Peter, of course. He said, no, Jesus, not me. Humility is tough. You see, Peter isn't the only one who struggled with humility. Humility is not something that was admired then or today. People today and in Peter's day would see humility as something of weakness or maybe even cowardice. It's only to be tolerated in involuntary submission as a slave would be. It's the opposite of pride, isn't it? Now, I don't know about you, but maybe you find at times pride to be offensive. Not your own pride, of course, but someone else's pride. I mean, it rubs us the wrong way, doesn't it? Pride, though, comes naturally. And only when we see pride as a sin are we able to address it. Proverbs 8.13 tells us this, To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate arrogant pride, evil conduct, and perverse speech. Pride prevents submission. Submission requires me to, first of all, deny myself, and second of all, trust that God is greater than any situation or person that I am facing. When I humble myself before others, I am also trusting trusting in the Lord, trusting in His Word, trusting that He knows good, He knows what's right, and I follow Him. In all things, I am to trust God. Now, in this situation, it becomes difficult because we've been told to believe what we should trust is what I think. And that's what makes submission, humility, difficult. We may say, well, what if mom and dad make a wrong decision? Okay, I'm still to trust in God. I still need to look to Him. If the pastor or leader makes a wrong decision, I still trust in God. He is my hope. If my husband or wife makes a wrong decision, God is my strength. You see, my hope is in Him, not in all these other situations that we face in life that don't go right. It's not always our responsibility to correct the wrong behavior of others. Our responsibility is to be right with God. To be right with Him no matter what He has allowed in the situation around us. There's a lot of situations that surround us that aren't right, aren't fair, But where is my hope? My hope is in Him. Because God gives grace to the humble, I want to be under His flowing fountain of God's amazing grace. I don't know about you, but I I think it's the second um, verse of a A Mighty Fortress. Listen to this rendition of A Mighty Fortress. If we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. Unless God's man was on our side, the man of God's own choosing. You ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is He. The Lord of hosts, His name, from age to age is same. He must win the battle. He will win the battle. He has won the battle. We don't need to worry about the battle. We don't need to worry about being right. We can be humble. And we can cast our cares upon Him as long as we remain or have Him in view. When we have our rights, our whatever in view, our self-sufficiency, humility is going to be impossible. The key to humbling ourselves is found in this final thought in verse 7, remembering that He cares for you. If we camp out there that He cares for you, then I can deal with these situations that I have no control over. The second one that we are told about, though, is to soberly resist the devil. Now we say, well, that's kind of strange. What does that mean? Now the problem with that is, that's what our text will say here in just a second, but but it's because we don't fully understand what soberly means. 
comes from Peter's call for us to be sober-minded, watching out for the devil. Listen to verses 8 and 9. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Some of the translations may have this sober-minded saying, be serious, keep a cool head. We are to be aware that we are surrounded by the deceiver, a roaring lion looking to devour you. The The image is of an enemy at every turn. What does that look like? Well, it could look like a lot of things. Some of the things I thought of that The devil wants to devour your dreams, your ministry, you, your family, your entire life. Therefore, Peter is saying, be vigilant, be watchful, be sober-minded, be on guard. Verse 9 tells us that our means of resistance is to not dig our heels in and fight the good fight, but to stand firm in our faith. You see, the first line of our defense is to stand on the Word of God and to, be, to refuse to be distracted or moved from that. The second line of defense is to stand in the power of God's Holy Spirit who has promised to strengthen us. Peter says, yes, yes, church, there will be attacks. Yes, there will be troubles. There will be those roaring lions in this life, but... But remember, the Lord is your protector. Now I think Peter is probably thinking back to Daniel. You'll remember the story of Daniel. Where Daniel is tossed in the roaring lion's den. How does he survive? Daniel tells us the Lord closed the mouths of the lions. We can stand strong in the faith. That's the only place we can stand. If you're like me, you're tempted to fight it out. How's that going? doesn't go very well for me. Peter says something else that's maybe a bit strange to you here, but, but he goes on to say that to remember the sufferings of others, that the, to remember that your sufferings are not unique, to be mindful that your sufferings are common with other believers around the world. How is that to encourage me? Well, in part, I think just what it says, that you're not alone in your sufferings. You see, one of Satan's lies, I think, to beat you down is to tell you that what you are facing, that you're the only one who has faced this situation, this problem, whatever it is that that you are struggling with. And that if anyone else had that same battle, they too would give up, so why don't you just give up? But you know, you're not alone. You see, that's the advantage of being in the church, that you are surrounded with others who understand the battles. Maybe it's not the same as yours, but, but they understand the, wrestle, the battles that you are wrestling with. They can testify to the hope that they found in Christ, in working through that, to finding hope in the midst of struggles. I think Peter would like us to say amen to Paul's observation in 2 Corinthians 4.17. For our present troubles are small, and they won't last very long. Now you may say, you don't know my troubles. They're not small. But Paul is saying, no, they're, they're small, and they won't last long yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them that will last forever. There's lots of verses. We won't get sidetracked into other verses like James 1 and elsewhere that encourage us about that. But it does leave us with our final question. It leaves us how we are to stand confidently in His grace. Let me read for you just the first couple verses um, of this section, verses 10, 11, and 12. Listen to this. 
Now the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus will personally restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have suffered a little. The dominion belongs to him forever. Amen. I have written you this brief letter through Salinas, and I know him to be a faithful brother to encourage you and to testify that this is true, the true grace of God. Take your stand in it. Remember Peter's, who Peter is writing to. Peter is writing to the churches of Asia Minor who are undergoing persecution, suffering for their faith. They have turned their backs on the pagan life they once lived, and now they feel the alienation of that choice. They feel alone. They're wondering if God really cares about them. Has God forgotten about us too? The suffering they face is unjust. Just as Peter has just called them to cast their cares upon them. Now when you look to stories like this, maybe you read through the book of Acts, or you read through another section and you say, or you read about Peter. Peter's a good example as well as all 12 of them. Why didn't they just get it? I mean, it's so clear the choices that they should make. Why didn't they just get it? I don't know about you, but maybe one of them could turn to us and ask us the same question. If we desire to grow in grace, we must rest in His promises. You see, it's our failure to rest in the promises that God has given us it causes all this other stuff. But when you rest in his promises, then we can have hope no matter what it is that we're facing. Trusting that he, that he will see us through. What does Peter's promise the believer here? That the Lord will personally restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have suffered a little. It's true. And if this is true, then I can stand, confidently stand in it, stand in His grace. I don't know if it's even possible, I doubt, doubt that it is, that we can have too much grace flowing in the church, in our homes, in our marriages, in our friendships. Now some, I know, if you talk too much about grace, they, they offer a pushback, don't they? The pushback is that, well, if you talk so much about grace and people just run out and sin and live for themselves and just live recklessly. Well, I tell people, that theoretically, I guess that's probably true, but I haven't seen it. Maybe you have, but, but I think there's lots of problems embedded in that idea. There's a tension, as we know, between standing in the law and standing in grace. The law motivates us to do what is right by giving us a list of do's and don'ts. And the hope is that with a do, list of do's and don'ts, then I can perform and life will be good. Grace, on the other hand, teaches us of what God has done. And that's all we need to know. And out of that, life will flow. But that's too easy. Maybe if you have come to Christ and telling people of, of that journey of finding grace, they say, that's too easy. Well, if it's anything more than that, then it ceases to be grace. Remember that idea in Romans 6.23, the free gift of eternal life? Grace is that free gift that we receive, not something we have earned. Paul warns us that if grace must be earned, that it no longer is a gift, but it becomes a wage. I try to think of an illustration. All illustrations are weak by themselves, of course. But, but think of a marriage. What is the motivator? What is the, the best motivator for me to be faithful in a marriage? To give a rule, thou shalt not? Not much of the time in the church, that's how we've approached it. But it doesn't really work too well, does it? See, the rule tells me that, but grace tells me something different. Grace tells me how much God loves me. 
Now you may say, well, how is that going to protect my marriage? Well, when I'm focused on how much God loves me, then my eyes are focused in the right place. It's only, I only will sin when I forget how much I am loved by God. If you don't believe that, consider a couple of illustrations. Why do I steal something? Now, I know thou shalt not steal, right? We all know that. But yet, now none of you I know, but some other people that you know maybe stole a pen from work or the bank or, or whatever. Now, I know we don't think about this uh, logically, but, but in part, I don't believe that God loves me enough to provide me that paper clip that I really, really, really need. And I need to take care of it myself. I lie, I cheat, I steal to get what I need because I can't trust God to provide what I need. Why do I lie? Same kind of thing. Because I don't believe that God will accept me for what is true. And so I create a lie. Lie to myself, lie to God, lie to my neighbor. And so why does someone cheat in their marriage? Well, ultimately they don't believe or cannot believe that God will provide for all their needs. They just need, deserve something more, something greater. Can we see how the sin flows from our failure to believe in grace, not because of it? You see, grace doesn't create a license of sin. Our failure to believe in the grace that has been given to us is what causes our sin. Our error is trying to work our way out of sin. We'll never find grace that way. Spiritual growth comes not in the rocky soil of the law, but in the fertile, lush soil of grace. In the closing words here, Paul offers more than a farewell. Verses 12 through 14. He's already mentioned Silas. Well, I guess he mentions him again here. Verse 12 through 14. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you to encouraging you and testifying that this is true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. There's a lot of little things going on here that, that we won't take time to dissect, but but Peter's doing more than just thanking the folks that had partnered with him. He's also summing up his thoughts. The purpose is to encourage and the purpose to reassure the believers of Asia Minor. The salvation he has been declaring is truly God's work of grace. And so now they have every reason to stand fast in it. and every confidence that we can follow in their footsteps. He speaks of Silas, who has helped him in the writing, distribution of the letter, maybe both. He speaks of him as being a faithful brother. In fact, he speaks of him as being the faithful brother. It suggests that Silas was known to the readers. The she who is in Babylon is one of those phrases that, that we don't get if we aren't looking back. And it's referring to the church in Rome. And finally, Peter concludes with the exhortation to greet one another with a kiss of love. A symbolic um, kiss of their relationship together in Christ. This ending is, is the, has the characteristics of the, the normal Hebrew blessings of peace that is sent out. And we can just read that and go on. But it's interesting to note here how the letter began with peace and ends with peace. If we go back to chapter 1, we find that this is the same peace that he spoke with there. Verses, verse 2, 1 Peter 1. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago, and His Spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed Him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more grace and peace. You see, in between this verse and the ending verses, we're told about this grace and peace that is to be ours in Christ. 
how this peace has been made possible. When? Even in the midst of suffering. Remember again, this is a church that has been suffering, isolated, persecuted, maligned, because they have left the, excuse me, the religion of their past and come to faith in Christ. This is one of the reasons that we chose to go through 1 Peter, because it's an important book for many here. Many who have left a life in the past and now are facing ostracism because of it. There was a cost for you when you chose, when you came to faith in Christ. And if you've journeyed with us through the book of 1 Peter, you've found how for all when we come to faith, it means that we turned away from something else. We saw a couple different illustrations of this, one of which probably speaks to what you turned away from. Just as with the believers in Asia Minor, some of you were lost in debauchery when you came to faith, and you turned from that. Others who were lost in some religion that weighed you down instead of giving you freedom. Others were lost in self-righteousness. Whatever it was had a hold on you and was unwilling to let go. Peter talks about how your friends and neighbors and family members are going to heap abuse on you to get you back to what you left. He reminds them to stand firm in the hope they have. Jesus warned his followers of the same thing. In John 16, he says this, They will expel you from the synagogues. In fact, the hour is coming when everyone who kills you will think he is offering worship to God. They will do this because they have not known either the Father or me. That's a context. That's where the peace and grace that is being promised is rooted. Peter reminded them of the importance of the Christian community as well. Of how those who are lost feeling isolation, who are suffering under the insults of others, are in need of the supportive community of the church to stand strong. You see, the gospel not only brings us salvation, but it changes our identity. One of my favorite verses in 1 Peter testifies of this. 1 Peter 2.10 Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. And Peter concludes his letter with a simple thought, more and more grace and peace to you. The source of this peace is found in grace through Christ. Whatever the circumstances, whatever you are facing, whatever your past is like, the person who is in Christ can always know the peace of God. For it's free to all. It's free to all who will trust in Him. That's our hope. That's the essence of what Peter would like us in the church in in, um, Asia Minor to understand. Next week, as I said, we'll continue on into 2 Peter, which has a different flavor to it, um, but I hope you'll be encouraged by it as well. Let me pray for us. Lord, I do thank you for the words that we've been able to find here in First Peter. May we go back and read through those verses. May we make note of it. Maybe even memorize a verse here or there that testify to us of the hope that we can have, the peace that is ours, of how we can rest in the promises that you have given. Thank you for the changed man that we see here. Thank you for the work that you've done in Peter's life. Thank you that you will do the same in us as we come to you in faith. Amen.